about six years ago, Katie and I went to Georgia for the weekend. And uh, this is actually the weekend that we told our families we were expecting Isaac. So it was a pretty memorable weekend. Part of the whole deal, we went to a Braves game on that Sunday afternoon. It was, those, you know, those of you baseball fans, it was Chipper Jones' final home game as Brave. You know, if you know anything about that. So we went to the Braves game, and then after that, we had to come on back to North Carolina. Um, so when we left the game, we hit the interstate, and, and admittedly, it took a long time to get out of Atlanta. If you've ever driven through Atlanta, it doesn't matter what time of day you're going through there, you're going to be stuck in traffic. But eventually we, we got out of Atlanta and we decided to go home a different route. We went on I-20 and then took I-95 north uh, up through South Carolina. And, and for the first few hours, we were cruising. Uh, it was uh, just driving through 95. There were no obstacles. It was smooth sailing, hardly any traffic. But then traffic halted to a dead stop. And we sat and we waited and we saw after about 30 minutes to an hour sitting here, the traffic was going absolutely nowhere. So at this point, we had a choice to make. Do we turn around and go back to Georgia or do we persevere and just try to get home somehow? Well, we had to work the next day. I had to I worked at Providence Baptist as cleaning and doing tables that I had to be at work and that morning. So we, we just chose to persevere and we, you know, traveled nameless back roads through middle of nowhere, South Carolina in the middle of the night. It was not the most uh, comfortable thing to do. Right. Uh, but finally, about 4 a.m., we got back home. Now, think about that road trip. I'm sure you've got stories like that, too, where you're trying to get home and there's an obstacle or something. I think following Jesus is kind of like that road trip. Some days the path is easy. We're cruising along. There are no obstacles. It's smooth sailing, no traffic. Other days, though, the path is hard. We hit an obstacle. We're at a standstill. And the path forward takes us through those back roads. It's scary. Here's the question for each one of us this morning, though. When following Jesus is hard, what do we do? When following Jesus is hard, what do you do? The early church had to ask this question for themselves because for a while following Jesus had been pretty easy. People were coming to faith in droves, 5,000 in a short period of time. A crippled guy was healed. Good things were happening. They were riding a wave upon wave of success and victory. But then Peter and John hit an obstacle. Last week we saw they were brought before the Sanhedrin, which is kind of like the Jerusalem's Supreme Court. And the Sanhedrin said, in no uncertain terms, stop talking about Jesus. And they realized following Jesus would not be easy anymore. So they were faced with the choice. We talked about this last week. Would they obey Jesus or would they obey human rulers? Would they speak the truth boldly or would they cave to fear? And in that moment, they told the Sanhedrin that they were going to continue to obey God. So then after that, we're going to see today that they returned to the church and they shared this roadblock they'd hit with the others. And that's where we're going to pick up our story today. So if you have your Bible, Acts chapter 4, verse 23, you follow along in your own Bible as I read it. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea, and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, 
to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. In this passage, we're going to look at what these Christians did when following Jesus was hard. And it's three things that we can do as well. First, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. First, when following Jesus is hard, we can remember God's character. We can remember God's character. When faced with this obstacle, these Christians did what they always did. They gathered to pray. They flocked together to pray to God with God's people. And as they huddled together, they began their prayer in this way. Verse 24, they said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In other words, in this prayer, they're beginning by choosing to remember God's character. They, they say two things. They, they remember who God is. Sovereign Lord. In the original language, this is, this is one word. That means basically a ruler with absolute power and authority. It's a ruler who's in charge of everything. There's nothing outside his power or influence. And that's who they remember God to be. They remember who God is. And they also remember what God has done. They said he, he made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In other words, everything they could see and touch and smell, and, and taste. All of this, God had made. And when they remembered God's character in this way, who He was, what He'd done, it put their problems into perspective. Yes, they were facing a scary threat. Yes, in many ways, their lives were at risk. Yes, following Jesus is now hard. But they who worshipped the God who was far, far greater than the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin is just a couple of guys in a, in a semicircle. God is the one who made everything. God is the one who sustains everything. Commentator John Phillips puts it this way. He says, the threats of the Sanhedrin were, he says, quote, rather like a two-year-old with a plastic hammer threatening the village blacksmith. That's what it's like. When, and when following Jesus is hard for us, we remember... Some ways our, our problems are like the two-year-old with the plastic hammer. Jesus is the village blacksmith. He is powerful. He deserves our trust. And if we let it, this truth can calm our fears. Now I like to come to you and act like I've got this all figured out, that I don't have fears anymore, but, but I don't have it all figured out. There are times when I am fearful. There are times when I have these fears and these questions, and honestly, as a parent to kids, when you see your kids go through stuff, these fears are real. And so this is why I need to pray in this way. We need to pray in this way. We recite these truths to ourselves, not because we have it all figured out, but because we need to remind ourselves. Yes, God is in control. We remind ourselves, I may not feel like it, it may not be easy, but I believe God is in control. Because when we feel powerless, we can remember He's all-powerful. When we don't feel like we have control over anything, we remember He controls all of creation. And of course, this doesn't mean that all our stories have happy endings because we're going to see a couple chapters later in, in Acts that some of Jesus' followers suffer and die for their faith. Today we look around the world and we see followers of Jesus who suffer 
and die for their faith still. So even though it doesn't mean we're always going to have a happy ending, it does mean that when hard times come, when following Jesus is hard, we can remember and be comforted by the fact that God is in control. And God does sustain everything. So we remember God's character. Number two, when following Jesus is hard, we can recite God's word. So first we remember God's character. Secondly, we recite God's word. Look again at verse 25. It says, Who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Second thing they do in this prayer is they recite God's word. In particular, they quote here a section from Psalm chapter 2. If you know anything about Psalm chapter 2, it's a, it's a punchy, powerful little psalm in, in which King David kind of recites to God and acknowledges the obstacles and the sufferings he was facing. And if you go back, we actually studied that passage back around Easter last year. Go to our website and listen to a message on Psalm 2. Now these early believers, when they read Psalm 2, they saw David in there, but they also saw this was in a sense the foreshadow of Jesus. See, Jesus Christ also faced opposition from all corners. right? This is about David facing opposition. Jesus also faced opposition. They note here from, from Herod, king of the Jews who mocked Jesus, and from Pontius Pilate, right, a leader of the Gentiles who murdered Jesus. In other words, they're saying Jesus also faced opposition from Jews, from Gentiles, from every corner. Now, now Jesus' followers were beginning to feel that same heat too. Following Jesus was getting hard. Now, if they were to stop here at this point in Psalm 2, that would be a pretty discouraging thing to remind yourself of. Right? David faced opposition. Jesus faced opposition. Now we're facing opposition. Right? That's doesn't seem all that encouraging. But, but I think when they recited Psalm 2, they also remember the end of the psalm. Uh, they, they recited not just, or they thought about not just what Psalm 2 began with, but, but how it ended. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to read Psalm 2. It's not very long. Read Psalm 2 to you, the whole thing, so you can experience not just the beginning, the bad part, but the end, the good part. So listen to, to this as I read this to you. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Right, All that was quoted in Acts chapter 4. Saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. In other words, in Psalm chapter 2, God's anointed suffers, but who wins? God wins. And because God wins, all of us who are part of his people win. Right? This we saw in Psalm 2. God sees their mocking and he laughs about it. 
God sees their petty attempts to be little g-gods, and and he holds them, it says, in derision. And in the end, they're not going to be the ones ruling the nations. God's anointed will. All kings and all rulers and all authorities on earth are going to submit to him. And in the end, the ones who are blessed are not the powerful and the mighty. It's those who take refuge in God. So I think they recited Psalm 2 to remind themselves, yes, we are threatened. We are reviled. This is getting hard. But David was threatened. Jesus was threatened. And one day, all of us who take refuge in this Jesus will be blessed. Times are hard. But Jesus wins. I think of it like this. Uh, Imagine you were reading a book and the book is filled with suspense. And you're in the middle of the book and and it's scary. You don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, You're not sure how the good guy is going to win, right? This does not seem like a hopeful book. So what do you do in that moment when you're reading the book and it seems scary? Flipped, Flipped to the very end, right? And you skim the last couple pages and you feel a sense of relief, right? Because because you know the end of the story. You know that the good guy wins, the bad guy loses. And the same is true here. We're stuck in the middle of the story. Sometimes it's scary. Sometimes we're not sure how it's all going to turn out. But God gives us the last few pages. God shows us what happens in the end, and he shows us that in the end, who wins? Jesus. And all of a sudden, when we think about this, we think about the end of the story, we don't have to be as worried anymore because we know the end of the story. And I don't know what it is you're going through right now. Maybe you're dealing with immense suffering, and you want to give up. Maybe you're wrestling with a deep sin struggle and you want to give in. Or maybe you're just weary. You're just tired. And you don't have enough energy to know what exactly it is that you want or what you need. But the point is you're stuck in the middle of the story and you don't know how it's going to turn out. Remember God's Word. Remember the end of the story. Times may be tough now, but one day we believe Jesus wins. And if we take refuge in Him now, one day we will be blessed. Let's cling tightly to this truth, to this hope. And so we can remember God's character. We can recite God's Word. Third, When following Jesus is hard, we can also request God's boldness. Request God's boldness. Look again at verse 29. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed in the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak of the Word of God with boldness. I've read this passage a dozen times or so probably in anticipation for the study of Acts and anticipation for this preaching this particular passage. And, and honestly, of all that we've read in Acts, this is the part I can't get over the most. I cannot get over the boldness of this prayer. If you or I were uttering this prayer, it probably would have sounded something like this. Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants safety. Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants security. Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants a nice big sword to defend ourselves. Lord, look upon their their threats and grant to your servants the ability to wipe them off the face of the map, right? Look upon their threats and you you fill in the gap of what you would have prayed in that situation. That's not what they prayed. They said, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. 
They didn't pray for the easy things that we would have prayed for. They prayed for boldness. They didn't look for an excuse not to share. They prayed God would empower them to share no matter how hard and how difficult things got. And they didn't just pray for boldness, right? They prayed God would continue to do miracles. And again, think about a miracle. If you do a miracle, what does that attract? A crowd, right? You're walking down the street, you heal a person, a crowd flocks. It's like they're asking to bring more attention to themselves for this. They, they're praying not just for boldness to speak one-on-one, but boldness no matter what, so the gospel would be proclaimed. And, and I see this, and it just doesn't make sense to our Western minds, does it? We don't pray these kinds of prayers. But, so we ask, how is it that they could do this? And we talked about this last week. Here's what we said. Their love for God was greater than their fear of death. Their commitment to God's mission was greater than their desire for safety. Pastor Ray Ortland says about this, he says, the early church when persecuted did not pray the wanted posters would disappear. They prayed for boldness. Church, I, I read this and, and I am convicted. Because I think our faith is so feeble. Our faith is far too comfortable. We wonder why we don't see massive movements of God like we did back then. Perhaps it's because we are more tempted to worship at the altar of safety and convenience than we are at the feet of our Savior. But these early believers knew they could die for their faith. But in the face of death, they prayed, God, make me bold. And that's precisely what happened. They prayed that God would make them bold. And again, it says, verse 31, when they had prayed, the place in which they gathered together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. I wonder what would happen if we prayed these kinds of prayers. I wonder what would happen if I prayed these kinds of prayers. What would happen if we prayed, Lord, please alleviate this suffering, but if you choose not to, glorify your name. If we prayed, Lord, please provide and protect, but if you choose not to, glorify your name. If we prayed, Lord, open doors for me to share the gospel, and when you do, make me bold. At a minimum, I think if we pray these kinds of prayers, we would at least be more aware of opportunities God does give us to be bold. I think these opportunities are there every single day, but we're, we're, we're blind. I'm blind. We miss them. And anyway, we keep coming back to this theme, but, but this is our theme for 2019. Again, who is that one person God has put on your heart? Um, would you pray today God would make you bold for that person. We got these flyers, right? I don't know where mine went, but you got the flyer. Would you pray God to make you bold to give that flyer to someone? And pray that that would just be the starting point for your uh, involvement with this person and seeing them come to faith. And maybe you're thinking this morning, look, Nathaniel, I, I could never be this bold. You don't understand. I, I'm too fearful. I'm not good at public speaking. I, I don't know what to say. I'm going to jumble everything up and it's not going to make any sense. If that's you, as it often is for me, we can remember the Savior that we worship. Think about what Jesus did for us. Jesus willingly laid down His life so you and I could be saved from eternal hell and judgment if we turn and trust in Him. And if you turn from your sins and trust in Him, you have been saved from eternal hell and judgment at the costly, costly price of His blood. Jesus died for us. I wonder if we would be willing to mildly inconvenience ourselves for the cause of our friends and neighbors who need to know Jesus. As we conclude, I want to share with you the story of a sister in Christ who lives in Pakistan. 
Uh, again, we talked about last week, here in the U.S., the only barrier to sharing our faith is our own fear. Some places the threat is much worse. This week I received a report from uh, a specific agency, and it lists the most dangerous places to be a Christian. Pakistan's in the top ten. This is what this lady says. Not too long ago, I went for a walk around the corner from our church. It was cold, and I was hungry. I wanted some lentils and rice. A man sold it next to the road from his food cart. I went to the cart and asked for a plate. While I was searching for the money in my wallet, the man who owned the cart recognized me. Are you one of those that go to that church? He asked. I was so pleased he recognized me as a member of the church. The pleasure was short-lived. When I said yes, he slammed the plate down and told me to go get a plastic bag. I cannot let you eat off my plate, he said. Others have to eat on this. I cannot let you defile my plates. She says, my heart was so broken. I left the food there and walked home crying. I felt sad and silly. As Pakistani Christians, we all know where we belong in this society. And yet at the age of 26, it still hurts me so much. I felt homeless even though my home was right around the corner. I felt like a nobody even though my parents and friends were all around me. I felt rejected even though I knew Christ died for me. She says, but this is where I heal. When I am able to show my love for others and demonstrate Jesus through the pain. Please pray we will continue to reach out to the rejected, the dispossessed, and the lonely. This is the story of nearly 15 million people who were called Christians in Pakistan. I am my, their story. They are my story. Thanks to your prayers and support, she says, you are part of our story. Let's pray our sister would be bold. And let's pray we would be bold too. Sometimes in our Christian life, we hit an obstacle. Sometimes following Jesus is hard. It may not be as hard as it is for this sister, but we hit those barriers. When those times come, let's remember God's character. God is in control. When those times come, let's recite God's word. We know the end of the story. Jesus wins. When those times come, let's pray God would turn us from fearful people into bold people so we could see our community come to faith in Christ. As we conclude, I'm going to pray and I pray that whatever the, the Holy Spirit is doing in your own heart and life, that He would convict us all and draw us to Himself. Let's pray. Father, I come to You this morning convicted of my own fears. Convicted of my own complacency. Convicted of my own desire for safety and comfort above the call to, to, to be engaged in your mission. Father, I pray that you would make me bold. I pray that you would help us all to remember the end of the story. To remember that you, God, are in control of all things. And to remember that we worship a Jesus who laid his own life on the line for us. May we be so bold as to lay our lives on the line for others. God, make us bold, conform us into the image of your Son. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.